English beginnings, Caribbean roots, story of a new Muslim community in East Anglia. This event is part of Cambridge University's and Anglia Ruskin's Islamic Society's Explore Islam Week. For more events happening this week, please go to the Facebook page or refer to leaflets. Uh, a brief itinerary for today. Um, there'll be a segment of Quran recited, uh, Surah Ibrahim, from the Buley translation. The lecture will proceed after that. And uh, following that will be an opportunity for questions and answers, inshallah. recitation recitation wherever Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alam tara kayfa daraballahu mathalan kalimatan tayyibatan kashajaratin tayyibah kashajaratin tayyibatin asluha thabitu wa far'uha fis sama تُؤْتِي أُكُلَهَا كُلَّ حِينٍ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهَا وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ وَمَثَلُ كَلِمَةٍ خَبِيثَةٍ كَشَجَرَةٍ خَبِيثَةٍ اجْتُثَّتْ مِنْ فَوْكِ الْأَرْضِ مَا لَهَا مِنْ قَرَارٍ يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ وَيُذِلُّ اللَّهُ الظَّالِمِينَ وَيَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَظِيمُ I'll just begin um, everything by uh, offering some biographies of the speakers making presentations here today. Um, first up, Hadjab the Samad Clark will be giving a brief introduction. Hadjab the Samad is from Ulster and was formally educated in Edinburgh in mathematics and physics. He accepted Islam at the hands of Sheikh Dr. Abdul Qadir Sufi in 1973 and later studied Arabic, Tajweed, and other Islamic sciences in Cairo. <coughs> He has a number of translations of classic Arabic works, including the Kitab al Adha of Imam Abu Hanifa, the complete 40 Hadith of Imam al Nawi, the Medinan View by Ibn, Ab Ibn Abi Zayed al Karawani, the Compendium of Knowledge and Wisdom by Ibn Rajab. He is also the editor and co-author with Abdul Rahman Doi of the revised edition of Sharia, the Islamic law. He is currently a man and teacher at the Ihsan Mosque and also serves as Dean of the Muslim Faculty of Advanced Studies. Following the introduction, the two main parts of the today's presentation will be uh, presented by Abdul Hamid Evans and Uthman Ibrahim Barson. Abdul Hamid Evans was born in New York and educated in the USA and the UK. 
He spent seven years in the remote mountains of southwest Ireland without running water or electricity and joined Norwich Muslim Community after embracing Islam in 1978. He was actively involved in community activities for the following two decades and studied European philosophy and psychology with Sheikh Dr. Abdul Qadir Sufi. He currently works as an independent in the international halal marketplace and currently serves for the Muslim Faculty of Advanced Studies as Director of Marketing. Hadrithman Ibrahim Morrison was born to Jamaican parents in London and studied law at UCL and applied linguistics at the University of Kent at Canterbury. He became Muslim in 1987 and led the establishment of Brixton Mosque. He is a founding chairman of the Blackstone Foundation Educational Trust and lives in Norwich as part of the Hisan Mosque community. Is currently occupied with specialist teaching, writing, publishing, and currently serves as the warden of the Muslim Faculty of Advanced Studies. Bismillah. This was sprung on me. Hajjothman <laughs> 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 so, asked me on the way here to say something about Islam. Um, just for my own personal interest, is anybody here not a Muslim? Actually, it doesn't necessarily change it because maybe we think we know what Islam is, but I'm not necessarily that. And in fact, I, I know less and less what it is the more I advance in years. Um, the question, what is Islam, tempts you to treat it as a noun. Mm -hmm. what, what if it's a verb? We think of it as a, as a thing. All the current discourse about Islam is set up to treat Islam as a thing. The Muslim community as a thing. What if it's a dynamic process? And this linguistically is correct, because Islam, as an Arabic word, is a verbal noun. It's called a mosdar, a mosdar. So somehow, an action caught as a noun. One of the most important aspects of the Arabic language is this dynamic sense to it. Whereas we live in a world dominated by nouns and by thus by things. We live in a world dominated by nouns and thus by things, and thus a material world. And to dismiss something to start with. I want to refer to something that we've been looking at in the Muslim faculty in some of our courses. This is addressed by two words. The first is technique. We're in the world of technique and if you like technology. But the word technology is a risky one because it invites us to think it's something to do with machines and we feel guilty about our laptops and our smartphones. So, actually, this thing of technique that we live in, that deals with the issues, that has, as it has taken Islam, the discourse of Islam, into itself and it has spewed it out in a form that we don't recognize. This is not a conspiracy. This, this technique is not... It is modern, but modernity is much older than we think it is. The technique is as old as the human race and is not confined to, to Europe and the Romans and the Greeks. In fact, it has a story to tell in the Muslim community. 
in the elaboration of the sciences. So we're, we're in a very critical point in the human story where technique and frames, and this is the second term, it's a useful term, is to put a frame around things. And everything today invites us to put frames about, about things and in certain ways. And we are invited to put a frame around Islam. And therefore, one would expect that I would deliver this talk, this, which is only a couple of minutes, inshallah, but to say Islam is based on five pillars. We believe in the prophets. We believe in Tawheed and an outline of, of creedal matters. But we've seen a, a very intense phase of that, and we've seen a very intense phase of a dynamic response to that from forces uh, against what we're talking about. And there hasn't been much uh, good in that in framing in either way. So to remove the frame, to remove the frame, we, we had a discussion in the car coming about the, the mass surveillance society that we're now uh, living in and which is now spreading, which is just one aspect of something. And it's not, it's not a conspiracy. It's not even a conspiracy. It's partly the nature of the technique and the technology. And but it's a, a part of it is this very intense putting frames around things. The media, nobody feels comfortable with anything without inframing it. And another word, which I hadn't in, intended to bring up, but the, the word that came up in, with us was spontaneity. This is a, it can be a trivial word, uh, as a kind of a word of personality. It can also be something quite deep and important. So if we see two motive forces, one is this technique in framing things, and, the, and then there's the need for us to find our spontaneity. And if I was then to dare to approach Islam as a topic, then I'd say it's only really one thing. It's only one thing you need to know. And that is that it, Whatever it is, all is, it is to put you in touch with your Lord. Because we, all, we understand what we mean. We don't mean that in an anthropomorphic sense. We, it is to put you directly in touch with your Lord, with, with your haqiqah, with your reality, which is the, the haq. It is Allah Ta'ala. That, that is it. If it's not doing that for us as individuals and as families and as communities and as an ummah, then it's not it. It's not the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I have a little piece here to introduce the other speakers. English beginnings, Caribbean roots. To attempt to explain the geopolitical, historical, and sociological forces that, are, that impinge upon the emergence of the Islamic phenomenon is a task beyond our present scope. As for the infinitely more complex matter of describing how these forces have combined with the minute and invisible movements and encounters within and between small organizations, Informal, informal groups and families in order to give rise to new communities lies even further from our compass. These incalculable permutations are inaccessible to us, as is the capacity to predict the moments of critical mass that result in the appearance here and there of new Islamic presences. As Muslims, it is easy for us to recognize and accept that the power of command behind this dynamic emanates from the hidden realms of our Creator, and, what, and that what we may conjecture as being the key moments, events, or personalities can never be taken as definitive without the aid of revelation, which of course came to an end with the last of the messengers to mankind, 
Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah Ta'ala is quite succinct when he reminds us in his generous book with words which are a translation of the ayat this is news from the unseen which we reveal to you you were not with them when they cast their reeds to see which of them would be the guardian of Maryam you were not with them when they quarreled this is from Surah Ali Imran therefore this short narrative makes no claim to trace the unknowable origins of Islam in Britain or even in Norfolk. What it provides is the slenderest outline based on the recollections of those who were present of certain events that would eventually lead to the settlement in Norwich of the community whose story forms the basis of this presentation. Thank you. It's my turn. Assalamu alaikum, good evening. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> As Abdus Samad just mentioned, I, what I want to try and do here is to look at um, look at what happened in a way that was really the result of a meeting of two men. But it didn't appear in a vacuum. And we were talking about it in the car on the way here. It was something that could not have been planned, and it also couldn't have been prevented. But there was there's a context that gave rise to it, that is really where all of us in our community in Norwich, including communities in Granada and Cape Town, and many Mexico, many parts of the world, we trace our roots back to this encounter. Um, and so I'm going to try and give you. Uh, give you some context for how that encounter took place and then what resulted from it. So if we think about England in the 50s, this was a time of, for me, England, it was grey, it was black and white television, the war was over, everybody wanted to get back to normality, people, there was still some food rationing, people were just making do and they were, for many of them, they were just quite happy with that. But at the same time there were other things going on, you can see for the You've got the family watching the black and white television. Both mum and dad are smoking. You know, this was part of the... Uh, that was politically correct in those days. Um, but for the young people, you know, that also really wasn't enough. There was rock and roll coming over the airwaves. And this was, was an indication that something else was going on. And it wasn't simply enough to sit at home and read, read the Daily Mail and, uh, and, and go to bingo. Because in amongst it all, as this moved into the 60s, all kinds of forces kind of got unleashed that I don't think anyone was necessarily prepared for. You had the mods and the rockers, the guys on the biker guys, and the mods who were into fashion, who rode the motor scooters. Um, bands like The Who came out, of the, uh, came out of the mod movement. And at the same time, you had all of this idea of London being this incredible center of fashion in the world. Um, and this was... This was an energy. The, the, the energy of, of London in the 60s was something that was bigger than the city. It was bigger than the people who were involved. It had, a, it had an international flavor to it, this idea of swinging London and whatever was happening at that time. Um, and it wasn't, just, um, it wasn't just fun. It wasn't just fashion and music and, and riding around on scooters and bikes. There, at the same time, there was a sense among people that, that Things weren't altogether right. We needed more than, than what was going on. And, what, and a lot of the things that were happening in the United States around that time spilled over um, into the UK uh, in terms of the civil rights movement, um, people wanting to find an identity. This idea of just being, you know, living in your house and having your family for a new generation growing up, that wasn't really. It wasn't even an option. It wasn't that it wasn't enough. Somehow it wasn't an option for a lot of us. Um, and we wanted to find a sense of identity of who we were and what we stood for. And also issues of social justice became of concern to people um, in terms of seeing whether things... Is the society that, that we now find ourselves in post-war, whether all the fighting was for, have we actually arrived at something that's... Is it good? Is it just? 
does it work? We were exposed to media, really in a way for the first time, the 60s suddenly became covered in the media. Uh, the, the war in Southeast Asia, the Vietnam War got covered. Um, and I think that everybody at that time I had this thing searching for a moral compass. People really were trying to find out what was right and what wasn't. And we were seeing things that were presented to us on the media, like the picture of this woman with her child who's obviously been killed as part of the collateral damage of the Vietnam War. And you must remember, I mean, we, we've had opposition movements to the war here, like with, the, with the, the war in Iraq and different wars going on. We've had an opposition to it here. The difference with the Vietnam War for the people in America is there was the draft. You were going, you're going to fight. Unless you have some way of getting out of it, you're going to be part of it. So the resistance to the war had a much more personal flavor to it than the, than the kind of opposition where people marched you know, in opposition to Britain's involvement in, the, uh, in some of the recent wars, wars in Iraq and things. But there was a very personal, it, it touched people's lives in a much more um, immediate way because if something didn't change, they were also gonna go to war and be part of that. And there was increasing, you know, this idea you know, resist the draft, don't register. It pushed people out of the mainstream of society based on their own moral judgments of what they felt was right and wrong. People were not going to be part of this. And there was a sense of wanting to articulate this rather than just having an angry shout, of which, of course, there were plenty. There was also a sense of wanting to articulate why we opposed this and not only what we were in, in opposition to, but also what we stood for. Um, there was an idea that this normality of this nice family sitting at home, for a, there was a generation emerging and normal was absolutely not good enough. Normal was not enough. You know, this, this idea of um, a line of police and a whole gang of people there in the street, th this, was, this was common. This was, this was part of people's everyday lives. Um, and there were questions that needed answers, and the answers were not, were not coming from the state. The state, in the end, was turning on its own people. The bottom photo here is from Kate Stent, uh, Kent State University in May, um, where, there was, where, where the, the state troopers shot, I think, four students were killed that day. Um, for me, those words, I found out about it through the words of a song at the time. Um, what if you knew her and found her dead on the ground? How can you run when you know? And this was, this was what the voice of rock and roll had become. It had also become the voices of social conscious, consciousness for people. That if, if we've seen this, how do we then just turn away from it? So this, this produced a kind of turmoil inside inside individuals, inside men and women, that in turn led to, a, to, to turmoil within our societies. And there was this sense of feeling that one was outside. You know, if that's the state, and that's what the state is doing, and this is the society that they've created, well then somehow, I don't want to be part of this. And there was a sense of feeling outlawed, and of being an outlaw, that I think, and we also, it was also kind of a badge of pride, I think, at that time. Um, but it didn't only, you know, it, 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 this, this crossed the Atlantic, you know, the media, media, music, what was going on on the TV and the movies, it, it, it had become already a global phenomenon at that time, you know, in the late 60s. And music played an extremely important role in that, that, as you can see, you know, with those Time magazine covers, it didn't only remain an underground thing, it was strong enough to force its way into the mainstream, so the Time magazine had a whole cover article about the hippie movement, you know, whatever it says, it philosophy, philosophy of a, uh, of a subculture um, that was the kind of thing which was being covered by Time magazine. Some of the bands at the time were also being covered. And uh, there was a sense of really trying to find another way to live and a feeling that if those are the rules, well, then we need to come up with other rules. We need to find our own rules. And I think even for a lot of us, even the idea that religion held an answer was also not necessarily on the cards for a lot of us. That we weren't necessarily looking for a religion. We were just looking for answers 
of something that seemed to be wrong. And there was an inner turmoil. So you've got social unrest and inner turmoil happening at the same time with a sense, you know, the music was doing something where that was also breaking the rules. Um, and even the forms of music, I mean, we've got a picture of Coltrane, that he was breaking down all of the forms of music as well, so that the, this idea that things had to be done in a certain way was no longer, <laughs> that isn't the tune that we were dancing to, you know, we were dancing to this idea that we could make our own rules and we had to find our own answers and the society was not going to find answers to us. There was also a sense that we needed to find our own roots, get back to our roots, that it wasn't necessarily something, we weren't looking for the answer in science fiction, although some science fiction may also have held some answers, but we were also looking to our own roots and wanting to find, you know, roots in heaven and on earth. You know, there was, there was spiritual awakening was part of that time of protest. Uh, and it was, it, it, it was also a significant part. And uh, it, I heard an interview, Che Guevara was interviewed on uh, on a Channel 4 program in it would have been in the 80s I think um, it was I think around the time he left Norwich um, and he was interviewed in Channel 4 and someone said to him what do you think was the cause of this emergence of Islam among uh, this this generation of, of of Western young people and they say, you know, was it the writings of the Orientalists and was it, you know, being exposed to immigrant Muslim communities and all these things? Yabakara said, absolutely no. He said, absolutely not. It was, there was an expansion of consciousness that took place with that generation, partly to do with the psychedelics, but also partly to do with the music and just the political and social context that we found ourselves in. And that if you are in a, in a turmoil and you have sincerity in your quest, doors open for you um, and I think for uh, those of us from that time there was a realization that there's more to life than a nine-to-five job a mortgage a car 2.4 children which I think was the national average at that time and then you retire and then you die and I mean I had an uncle who did exactly that exactly that and within six months of, he worked in a bank within six he was my father's brother within six months of retiring he was dead and I mean I knew absolutely categorically that I didn't want to go down that route. And this time, in that time of social unrest, this idea that there's a cosmos out there, as well as being a cosmos inside me, was not an idea. This was something which was part of our experience from that time. It wasn't, it wasn't a concept. It was something that we lived and understood that later became very useful to us when we heard messages about Tawhid, for example, when, we, when Tawhid was explained to us. It wasn't conceptual. Okay, I've got it, got it. Reality is one, yeah, okay. That, that, there was no conceptual difficulty with that because of the experiences of those times. And that in this, there was a quest to find another way to live. It wasn't enough to, to just protest. This had to, it turned, it had to take on a proactive thing. Okay, well, if we can't trust the rules that they're giving us, and we can't trust the scenario, and we can't trust CNN or the BBC, we have to find our own way of doing this. And this involved making commitments. This very well could have been me, this top picture. Actually, it isn't, but I mean, I went, as it was explained, I went and lived in the mountains of Southwest Ireland without running water and electricity because I wanted to find out what life was actually about. And, you know, this idea, it's a, it's, a Zen, it's a Zen statement, you know, before enlightenment, fetching wood and carrying water. After enlightenment, fetching wood and carrying water. And, I mean, we'd read these things. We, you know, we understood those concepts and we thought, okay, I'm going to go and live somewhere and fetch wood and carry water. But we were making commitments to ourselves. We'd, we'd matured to the point of, of becoming men and women. We were having marriages and having children and raising families. And we were having to make up the rules of how you do that. How do you do that? We knew we didn't want to do what our parents had done. But we, were, we didn't know what is the balanced relationship between a man and a woman, or between men and when, or women and women. Or how, how, what do you tell your children when they ask you, Daddy, where did I come from? And what, is there God? 
you know, we, we didn't necessarily have answers for those things. Um, but we understood that we had to build something, not just out of bricks and mortar, or even geodesic domes, which was part of the thing that was going on at the time. Um, but that we had to build personal identities, family identities, social identities, community identities. We had to, we had to build those structures and it was no small thing. These were, these were real commitments. And again, this wasn't only in the subculture. This, you know, Time magazine is God dead. You know, this, this also became part of the overall consciousness of the time. So this phenomenon that happened among, you know, among the hippie subculture um, was not confined to that. The ripples went far beyond that. Uh, and, you know, the first photos from space came back. This idea that, that, that the Earth is another planet in this enormous galaxy floating in unimaginable space became part of the realization that, that, that this, is, this is also where we are. We're also just floating on a speck, you know, whizzing around in the cosmos. It, it's, a, it's a sobering thought when it hits you in a certain frame of mind. Um, and exploring consciousness and, and, and what is this earth, what is God, all of these big questions and, and trying to make sense of religion which we I think also felt it kind of betrayed us in some way. Um, there was something about three in one and one in three which you know I think when I turned 11 the idea of the Trinity somehow stopped working for me uh, and that, that you know, th these, these questions became part of what was going on with all of us. And so in that sense, it, it, it's, it's every, people traveled. That was what we did. I mean, instead of going to university, I thought, okay, I'm going to travel. So I traveled. But I didn't just travel to have fun. Um, people traveled for knowledge. They traveled to have different experiences. They traveled to explore other cultures. And, and at the same time, it was informed by their own inner search. And I mean, this picture here, you've got George Harrison from the Beatles sitting with the Hare Krishna uh, community. And this was, this in a way was, was, this was part of the fusion that happened, that, that from, you know, being a, performing in the, you know, the cavern in Liverpool, to then being, you know, sitting with the Maharishi in India, and then working with the Hare Krishna community in London. These were natural progressions. This was all going somewhere. You had people who were traveling and finding themselves open to new faiths and new behaviors. A lot of the, tr oh, there was this idea of going east, but not everybody went east. <laughs> Some people went due south. And this idea of Morocco being on the map for this kind of spiritual travel and spiritual experience was, it didn't, there was, it, it, I think it kind of came as a slightly later wave, um, but it, it, it opened up an absolutely new landscape for an inner journey and an outer journey. And in it, what people saw was that they discovered a way of worshipping. It was a new discovery of an old way of worshipping. And it, 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 something which was, it was open to men and open to women. And I think it, it, there was, it was a doorway. It was a doorway. And for us, how this, how this story unfolds is really based on the meeting with these two men in this place. Um, and again, we were talking about it in the car on the way here, and I said, and I thought, I must say that while I'm there. It was a meeting between Sheikh Abdul Qadir, Ian Dallas, the writer, um, who took the Muslim name Abdul Qadir, and Sheikh Mohammed Ibn Habib, who at this point was over 100, 110 years old, um, and was a was a teacher of a teacher of Islam, a teacher of Arabic, a teacher of, of, of Islamic fiqh. Um, he was an alim. He was also a teacher of tasawwuf. He was a, he was a sheikh of, of instruction. And you know, this was a meeting that could not have been planned, and it could not have been prevented. And if you look, you know, if you if you find more about the details of how that story happened, and there's a book I'm going to make reference to in a moment, which which describes this this meeting, um, and 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 what came from it. Uh, this was 
this is not only the example of, of how Islam spreads, but that, you know, that the, someone with deep spiritual knowledge meets someone who has a deep spiritual thirst. When that happens, something extraordinary happens, even if it happens in isolation, something extraordinary happens for the two of them. But if it happens within a social setting where you've got social injustice, you've got unrest, you've got people seeking, you've got people trying to find new ways to live, who are putting themselves out on a limb to go and live, find another way to live, where they feel we're not going to find instruction from anywhere, we've got to find it ourselves. And I think, you know, certainly for me, but I think probably for a lot of us, um, it w we were kind of surprised that Islam was the answer. Um, and surprised and, and of course in the end delighted but uh, it, I think initially it was kind of a surprise certainly it was for me I thought like you know 1400 year old religion it's not quite what I'm looking for I'm looking for you know something that's the age of Aquarius <laughs> you know all of that but it, it, it uh, this 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 meeting actually was a was a was a perfect fusion of past and present and future in, in, in a moment that had an extraordinary ripple um, that went out. And if you, if you can find it, the Book of Strangers, I, I think there probably are editions of it around. Um, Shea Bacardi wrote it using his family name, Ian Dallas, he, he wrote it about that journey. It starts off as kind of science fiction. And halfway through the book, it turns and it goes through this keyhole that actually becomes the narrative of actual event. But his introduction to it is, is a vision of, of the modern society that we live in, and he's looking at it as if it's a kind of science fiction society, because in many ways it was. <laughs> um, but, it, but it changes and becomes an actual narrative of him searching and finding a teacher, and what happened in that meeting, and what happened as a result of it. And I mean, here we've got and I couldn't find a better photo of these old fukara. These were the people who were there in the Zawi and Meknes who, who were Sheikh Muhammad ibn Habib's students. Um, and this was, a, this was a Zawiya full of old men. And it became this, the, the, the lower picture are a group of people who came back with Sheikh Abakada, I think maybe a year or two after his me initial meetings with Sheikh Muhammad ibn Habib, who had he'd gone out and told people about Islam and said, you have to come to Morocco and meet this man. And so people went and were transformed by those gatherings. Um, and so this was, you can see it goes, this is like atomic structure. You go from a nucleus to a ring of electrons around it and moves to another ring around that, held by the power of this, of the, of the force of the nucleus. And this, it moved back to London. This, this, the, the reality of that, of the Zawiya in Morocco, the truth of it moved to London. And this, this community got together in, in Bristol Gardens. The 33 Bristol Gardens was, uh, was, they were squats. They squatted in some of the houses there. I think they were owned by the council. Yeah. Um, and they were empty. And it was like, okay, let's move in. And uh, if you want to know more about it, you can ask Hajj Abdul Samad because he was there. I came a little bit later to this. Um, and what's interesting for me was that I didn't meet Sheikh Abdul Qadr and I didn't meet Sheikh Mohammed and Habib. I never met Sheikh Mohammed. I didn't meet Sheikh Abdul Qadr until later. What I met was this group of people. And I thought, oh my God, I've got to go to Morocco. And <laughs> And then I realized it actually wasn't about going to Morocco. It wasn't even about meeting Sheikh Ricardo. It was about listening to what these people had to say about the way their lives had been transformed. That was enough. That was the message. It wasn't about anybody. It was about the truth that, that they then brought with them and the way that their lives were being transformed. So this was, this was an attempt to live together in another way. People were married. People had children there. There was endless dawah. Sheba Khadr insisted that people wore robes and turbans. Of course, you may not. <laughs> the resolution isn't quite high enough to see who this is, but there's Hajjab al right there in the photo. Um, 
these were these were experimental times. But it was everybody say, okay, this is this is what our lives are about. Our lives are for this. This was travel for the sake of our. Was living for the sake of our life. Was studying Dika for the sake of our life. And 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 it rippled out because of course that it couldn't remain as a squat in London, um, and it wasn't big enough. And so there was an attempt to kind of create a Muslim village. And again, we were, it, 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 there was a sort of idealistic vision. There was a purity of vision. There was a naivety of vision. Um, but the, if what we've got is right and true and strong, then we can take it wherever we want. We can do, we can do anything with this. And so there was, um, people moved to Wood Dorling Hall up in Norfolk. It was bought by someone in the community who had, who, who, who had money for a moment. <laughs> and, uh, um, and this was, this was really the beginning of community building. And this was a time of, of real discipline. It was a time of hard work and also incredible hardship. It was incredible poverty um, around that time. People basically didn't work. And I think that I've heard Chair Bacardi say that really stopping people working was to enable them to, ex to experience directly, firsthand, that your provision does not come from your work. Your provision comes from Allah. It, yes, you work, you get paid, you get money, but that process is by Allah. Part of being able to understand that happens when you stop that process and you realize that you still eat. You still eat, you still have clothes, you still travel, you still go to the movies, you still have fun. You still do all those things. It all just happens in a completely different way. But that experience changes you. Um, and again, the experience in Wood Dawling was too much basically for everybody and wasn't sustainable and it led to everybody moving into Norwich and the establishment of the Esan Mosque um, which was established in 80... When, 77. 77. <coughs> yeah, it was rented initially in 77 and then bought later on um, by a donation. And this became the epicenter of the community. And so people moved from the attempts at communal living, and some of them kind of carried on in terms of people shared houses and did whatever was necessary. Being part of the community was the absolute priority of life. It, working and how you managed to do it was just secondary. The important thing was that you were there, was that you were part of it. And this idea that you're, you're on the dean of your close companions, as it says in the Hadith, and I mean, we, we you know, the idea of going away was tinged with sort of danger and, and, <laughs> and kind of terror that if, you know, if I go away, I don't know what will happen. And there's a great deal of wisdom in that because you know, Allah is with the Jamaat and, uh, and the Jamaat has a strength that has a protection. Mm -hmm. And this was, this was really how that community, how that community started. In terms, of it, it, it became an outpouring of, of, of books in the, over the next few years. And these are all available. D1 Press was established. These books are all available. I took all the covers off the website. They're all online. You can look at these books. But they're all from that time. And some of them were translations of classical texts from, from the Tarika. Um, and, and others were books that Sheikh Abu wrote, or they were commentaries uh, of, from, from the D1 of Sheikh Mohammed and Habib, um, and also just current current writings of the time. And it, it was a powerful cocktail of, 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 of words and words and visions and meanings that came out from those. And as we shall see, those words spread out out of Norfolk and down into London. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Hajjokman, who was there in the epicenter of, uh, of the Caribbean roots of, uh, of South London. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just trying to get comfortable here. I'm looking at some black faces. <laughs> uh, this, this won't do. There's not enough. Where are you all? Okay. Good to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> Not that there's any harm in seeing the rest of you, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I did, I'm glad you mentioned what you mentioned at the beginning about the um, London in the 50s and, you know, and 
early 60s and so on, that greyness. Mm. I was trying to um, explain to my wife, who was growing up in Jamaica at the time, and my children, who would know nothing about any of this, um, I tried to explain something of what it was like, and I thought of um, an experience that you know that some of us, you know, as children, had to had to go through in London at that time. And I see it as grey. It was. It, it has still. When I think about it now, it still has that grey feeling about it. And um, what I described to them was um, the experience that I had to go through, certain, you know, various mornings in the week, you know, just before going to school. And um, my mum would maybe send one of us out to go and get some bread at the local baker's or something. And, uh, and it was something that, you know, that I dreaded, but which um, somebody had to do it. And, uh, what it and, and here's how it went. You know, we take the, the change, whatever it was, um, was a loaf of bread, one and six or something, you know, that, that, that type of thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, in various bits of change, sixpence and a shilling coin or something. And, yeah, you hold on to it tight. Heaven help you if you lost it. <laughs> and um, <coughs> go to the baker's who's down the end of the road. I, I can see it now. And uh, I'd go in, and I'm, you know, I'm seven or eight years old or something. And the chances were that I'd come back empty-handed because you'd stand there in the shop, the baker, and he would serve every white person that came at that time in the morning, which were a lot, before I got a look in. The, you, you watch a seven or eight-year-old boy stand there, panicking, holding on to this money um, for dear life, and he would serve all of his white local customers before even looking in my direction and standing there and just knowing that that was going to be the case. Um, it was dreadful. <coughs> and then what would happen from time to time is that we sold out by the time it came to me. And so I'd go home empty handed. And, um, but then, and you know, you're expecting to get told off in some way. I mean, you know, you know I've sent you out to get the bread, we need to have breakfast, where is it? And um, but looking at it now, you know, from this distance, as a parent myself, that must have been an incredibly difficult thing for my mother to do, knowing that that was what she was sending us into, into that kind of situation, to go out into the world and have this kind of encounter, where you were surrounded by people who hated you automatically, just automatically, and were prepared to do that to a youngster. You know, what effect that has, I mean, you know, I, I, well, you can see it in front of me, I mean, I became Muslim, but I mean, you know, the, uh, it wasn't pleasant, and I remember that as being a grade, and difficult. <coughs> the um, <coughs> now let me come to the uh, to the rest of it. So Caribbean roots we return again to the heady days of the 60s, with this mixture of artistic creativity, spiritual exploration, and political activism that seemed to take Europe and America by storm, as we've been hearing. Nonviolent peace movements vying with explosive student protests and race riots. Yeah, I remember it well. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. 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 That was fun. <laughs> was Saturday afternoon. Seeing police outside like now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I like that. Get the economy rolling. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, race rights demanding social justice and civil rights saw intellectuals, artists, writers, and musicians cross fertilizing to provide the era with a soundtrack, commentary, and imagery so captivating that it would be difficult to imagine how restless young West Indians growing up in 1960s and 1970s London could fail to be influenced. Rebellious and dissatisfied by historical necessity, these twice removed West Indians, and this twice removed um, description is something that um, Sheryl Bukada, um gave to us. The, the first removal being the removal from the African continent to the Americas, mm -hmm. and the second removal being from the Americas to our wonderful shores here. <clears throat> and so these twice removed West Indians, though concentrated in the black urban archipelago of Lambeth, Wandsworth, Southwark, and Lewisham, they were citizens of the international diaspora bequeathed to them by the Pan-Africanism of Marcus Garvey, 
which transcended barriers of language, nationality, and geographical distance between peoples of African descent with a genuine sense of solidarity and brotherhood. Therefore, taking inspiration from the heroic defiance of the Black Panthers, Fidel Castro, Patrice Lumumba, Tommy Smith, and John Carlos, came as naturally to them then as their sense of belonging to the Ummah of Islam would become later on. They were born up on a wave of Afrocentrism articulated with fiery intelligence by the likes of Stokely Carmichael, Eldridge Cleaver, Leroy Jones, Angela Davis, and H. Rat Brown. However, incipient Islam was also near at hand, running like an electric current beneath the surface of these movements. The trend, which had begun amongst beat generation black artists and musicians such as Art Blakey, and Yusuf, Yusuf Abu Latif, of confessing Islam outright or declaring their affinity with the Muslim religion, had, by the 1960s, caught up with other iconic figures, including Leroy Jones, and the late Leroy Jones, who died last year, <coughs> Amiri Baraka, of course, is the name he took, John Coltrane, Max Roach, Miles Davis, McCoy Tyner, Dollar Brand, um, Abdullah Ibrahim, H. Rat Brown, Jamil al -Amin, Jimmy Cliff, The Last Poets, etc. None of this will have been lost on the young West Indians in London, hungry for pride in their identities and searching for new spiritual and political directions. This is me I'm talking about, by the way. I mean, I'm not sure everyone's going to agree, but this is, this is really my story. By the time the quasi-Islamic black Muslim movement was brought to international notoriety by the dangerous charisma of Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, Africa had long been recognized as a Muslim continent, and Islam claimed, therefore, as the natural religion of the black man. Christianity, with the sole exception of the hippie-like Rastafarians, was the religion of the oppressors and their brainwashed Negro lackeys. The point here is that the idea of Islam, though still generally perceived as exotically alien, had staked an attractive claim within the collective consciousness as a radical, virile, and morally disciplined alternative. Many young men and women responded to this early signal, only to find themselves sidetracked into involvement with racist organizations such as the Nation of Islam. And like Malcolm, it would be some time, if ever, before they encountered the reality of authentic Islam. However, in the early 1980s, two Jamaican Brixton-based brothers set out on foot with the intention of making a pilgrimage overland to the Rastafarian settlement of Shashamene in Ethiopia. After many months during which they endured unimaginable dangers and hardships, they were finally forced to stop in the Sudan. In short, they returned as Orthodox Muslims, opening up the ground floor of their small house in Belfields Road as Brixton's first mosque and point of reference for West Indian Muslims and those interested in finding out about Islam. The sudden, the sudden death of the older of the two brothers and difficulties surrounding the tenancy of the house meant that by the late 1980s <coughs> it had become necessary to relocate to another small terrace house in nearby Ferndale Road. It was here that a number of the key players converged who would be instrumental in steering the Brixton community into the most confident phase of its development. It was here also that they received perhaps the first of what would later become fairly frequent delegations of white Muslims from the community in Norwich. It had already become clear that the Ferndale Road premises was quite inadequate for the needs of this rapidly expanding community, with new Muslims entering the Dean on a weekly basis, as well as other Muslims beginning to gravitate from other parts of South London. Political manoeuvres were set in train with Lambeth Council, which was headed at the time by the outspoken socialist Linda Bellos, who became instrumental in enabling the community to acquire in Ramadan of 1990 the premises at number one Gresham Road that was destined to become known as Brixton Mosque. The second mosque in the country to be established by indigenous British Muslims after the Ehsan Mosque in Norwich. As well as acquiring the mosque building, this dynamic core group had also succeeded in setting up the Ash-Shahada Housing Association in order to meet the particular housing needs of local Muslims with early developments bearing the telling names of Dan Fodio Court, Abdullahi Gardens, and Bello Close. Within a very short time, the mosque's reputation as the epicenter of the burgeoning new growth of Islam within the black community began to attract a great deal of positive attention, 
and, like the Norwich community before it, achieved the level of renown, both at home and abroad, that at the time seemed quite disproportionate. By the end of 1991, the first obvious signs that all would not remain well began to appear when the modern wave of Wahhabism, generated by the Saudi university system known as the Salafi movement, began to take hold amongst the young and the more impressionable members, whose susceptibility made them easy targets for this simple, fundamentalist ideology, designed for its incompatibility with any form of traditional Islam. Therefore, the fact that the mosque leadership, which had passed to, to me, was now determined on a course of allegiance to the traditional guidance and instruction of Sheikh Abdul Qadr Sufi, it would simply be a matter of time before the mounting antagonism within the community reached breaking point. In fact, a teaching visit to the mosque by Sheikh Abdul Qadr in 1992 revealed the state of affairs as the majority of ordinary members had been deterred from attending by the Wahhabi troublemakers. In 1993, in order to diffuse tensions which were on the point of erupting into violent hostilities, the core of the leadership and their, and their supporters left the mosque in the, hands, in the hands of the various competing parties to decide the matter of its future governance between themselves. For the next two years, what was still a sizable group which had remained loyal to me were finally free to pursue their chosen path with all of the commitment and vigour that had previously gone into raising the reputation of the Brixton Mosque to the position of prominence it had enjoyed prior to falling into the hands of the Salafi factions and into infamy as the base of operations for the notorious shoe bomber Richard Reed and his handlers. Over the next two years, the new community remained in the heart of Brixton, first occupying a building that would come to be known as the Ribat, while continuing its business activities from rented commercial premises on the Angel Town Estate, referred to as the Unit. During this period, the community consolidated its entry into the fold of Sheikh Bukhada's people, studying Maliki Fiqh under Haj Yassin Dutton, participating weekly in the spiritual practices of the Habibiya Darqawiya Sufic order under the supervision of Haj Abdul Habbuli at a centre run by the Norwich community in Slough, travelling widely and frequently in order to attend conferences and gatherings, and hosting visitors and conferences in return. This phase also saw the community's leading role in the activation of the League of the Black Stone, founded by Sheikh Bukhada as a means of purifying the pan-Africanism and racial politics of the past. Hence it is from this initiative that various publications that address these issues began to appear under the imprint of the Black Stone Press. Finally, in 1995, just as a small reconnaissance group was posted to Barbados to assess the feasibility of establishing a new centre in the Caribbean, the community was invited by Sheikh Bukhada to establish themselves in Norwich. So it was that before long, a significant number of the most influential Muslims from the Brixton community moved from London to Norwich to the great enrichment of the Norwich Muslims and, increasingly, to the life of the city as a whole. This has resulted in the present exciting indigenous mix of the Muslim community in Norwich, which, for more than 30 years, has been showing conclusively that Islam is entirely compatible with British culture and that it truly does offer a response to many of the social and economic problems which currently beset British society. So that's basically, um, you know, the uh, story as I remember it, more or less. And um, the experience of being in Norwich, in that community, um, and yeah, this is a pretty representative shot. It really is, um, it came just at the right time because as I mentioned, we were doing fairly innovative things in London. We had the Housing Association. We were trying to um, see whether or not it was possible to establish Muslim community and a Muslim way of life in a city like London. And um, we did everything we could. We literally um, built our own housing developments in which and we gave priority to Muslims who were in need of accommodation. It was, a, it was an, an extremely... Um, vital um, facility at that time, as you can imagine, people were becoming Muslim at a great rate, which meant that families were being disrupted. It meant that people were being thrown out of their families. It means that, um, you know, when you have a, you know, West Indians don't play with certain things. If you're Christian, you're Christian. And to go to your parents and say, well, I'm not Christian anymore, is like saying, well, throw me out. And um, 
and in short order you'd be out on the street, you know, men, women alike. And so to have this possibility of housing people um, was, was really quite crucial. The, um, <coughs> And it, was, and it was it was a pretty exciting time. I remember the, the development I lived in, it's called Bello Close, named for um, Mohammed Bello, the son of um, Othman Danfodio. And um, I remember when more or less all of the um, houses in, in, in the close were more or less occupied. And we decided to have a gathering, a kind of welcome to everyone. And um, so I gathered everyone you know, in these sort of open area and I remember you know a part of the speech I made I pointed down to the end of the drive where there were these sort of automatic gates you know all very nice kind of you know it's really you know state-of-the-art kind of gated community kind of thing and I pointed down to the gates and I said look this is nothing what we've achieved here is nothing outside of those gates is a sea of kufr and that phrase always comes back because it's the actual phrase I used at the time. I said, outside of those gates is a sea of kufr. And, um, and that kufr is, was the kufr that we'd been experiencing, not only from people who were ignorant of Islam, but also amongst the Muslims themselves. Because everyone was kind of running about. As I mentioned, this, this Wahhabi, Salafi thing, um, to my way of thinking at that time, and I don't think a lot's changed since, was... Um, generated by a, a, a brand of kufr. It was the distortion of um, the knowledge that Islam brings with respect to community, with respect to jama'ah, with respect to how Muslims should treat each other and what our priorities are. Um, and so um, my sense at that time, not wanting to put a damper on anything, was that you know this is just the beginning? We've only just started, and at the same time, you know, one could see our little children sort of running about, all very excited. We're about to have a barbecue or whatever, and they just wanted to eat something. Um, but you know, for those of us who had you know grown up struggling to establish the deen, we're looking at them and we're saying, well, we don't know if this is going to be enough for you. And that's the truth. We couldn't. Um, we couldn't do it. We couldn't. Um, we didn't manage in. Brixton at that time to hold it together. The, um, the whole opposition that we had from the Salafis and the threats that we faced, that I faced personally, um, I'm talking about threats to life and limb, um, that's not the way that one envisaged Islam when one entered the dim, when one said shahada, one said shahada with the expectation of transformation and renewal. Of, of, and social justice. I didn't expect within a couple of years to be having my life threatened by other Muslims. But this is what um, emerged out of that ignorance. And um, so the opportunity to um, take ourselves and our families to another zone where the possibility of establishing a way of life that, w that would allow us to transmit whatever it was we acquired of the deen in a social sense to our children. I mean, the move to Norwich was an absolute lifesaver. And, um, you know, it's the best decision and, and that I ever made. And um, it didn't make sense to anyone at the time. You know, if you're, you're a Londoner and you think London is the centre of the universe and everybody thinks London is the centre of the universe, how can you leave you know, um, London to go out into um, the middle of nowhere, and not just in the middle of nowhere, the middle of nowhere full of white people. <laughs> um, that's just, you know, that's just madness. I mean, if that's what being a Muslim means, then leave me out. You know, that's the kind of reaction. It made no sense to anyone, but it made every sense to me. And um, <clears throat> so we did it, and never looked back. I mean, it's been the most extraordinary experience, and um, the, um, and those children that who, who I mentioned earlier, who were running about um, not knowing what their future is going to be, I mean, they've grown up in Norwich. And, um, and the stamp of the Norwich community, they carry it. You know, you see them and you know that, you know, that they, not only are they Muslim, but they are 
Muslims of this time and of this place. And um, their expression of the deen, the way they speak, um, the way they um, interact with each other and, and interact with the um, world around them is something to behold. It, it, it's thrilling. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> of course I'm black, isn't it? You let him go on for ages, now you want to stop me. <laughs> There's no getting away from it. <laughs> um, sh should we have a question and answer? That's okay with you. Does anyone have any questions? I've got one. Hisham? Yes. Any questions? Yes. Uh, so, so I had a question for the brother. Uh, so, 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 so it was very different to what we used to in terms of regular talks about Islam uh, in the universe. And this is a greatly enlightening uh, issue for somebody who's not indigenous. I'm not even British to start with. Uh, to know about the existence of such an indigenous community from both angles. Uh, however, so, so when you did mention about the, the introduction of, of uh, troublemakers from abroad in the form of Wahhabism and Salafism. That kind of resonated the same way that I'm seen as a Muslim in Europe, you know. Uh, and all these Muslims with their troublemaking ideas coming to Europe and infesting our lands. Do you not think that what you reflected as is the same kind of mindset, uh, irrespective of religion, which is those foreigners or those external people coming with their ideas, which I don't agree with, mm -hmm. thus as a result they have kufr, you know, which is a very strong word to use, you know. Mm. Uh, do you not think that perhaps it's, it's a mindset that we may need to reconsider, especially in the, the spirit of, of Islam in a, in a country where we're struggling to, to survive a, a, as, as, as a community and, and put away individual differences, which I'm sure uh, vastly mm. troubled you, like you said, yeah. you had threat of limb, and et cetera, mm. and look away from this as, as, a, as a spiritual or a or a religious conflict rather than an individual conflict. Do you not think that maybe there's some benefit in, in looking towards commonalities and rather than brandishing differences? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, thanks for that. That's a very interesting um, set of observations and an interesting question at the end of it. Um, the, um, you see, the, what I would say to that is that the community that was, that suffered from that was an indigenous Muslim community. In other words, Islam trying to take root in a place, in a very difficult place, and struggling to do that and managing something. And so you're, they're Muslims. For every intent and purposes and purpose, they're Muslims. And it's taking root. And, um, and it's at a very vulnerable point, but it's taking root. I don't think it's too much to have an e the expectation that Muslims coming from traditional heartlands of the deen or an influence coming from that direction ought to be a benign and beneficial one. Um, instead, it turned out to be this other force for negativity and conflict, which threatened to actually, which in fact it did undo um, the um, a lot of the of what was achieved by these struggling um, Muslims, and um, it led to what it led to. I mean, if it, if that's what it took, and Allah knows best, for me and my family to get out of that situation and find myself in Norwich, then I'm glad. Maybe I'll thank them one of these days. Um, but um, the um, but you know Allah does what he likes when he likes, and that was a result for me, which is a good result. But at the time, it was not pleasant. And the mindset you refer to, you see, it's a legitimate mindset because it is a legitimate community and communities have their mindsets, they have their culture. Ours was a nascent indigenous Muslim culture and mindset. It was legitimate because it, that's where it belonged. It was there by right. And so if, so just as, you know, if I were to say, well, you know, well, let's go to Egypt tomorrow, let's go to Cairo, why not? Mm. The first thing we think is, well, I mean, how are we going to survive there? I mean, we're going to need people there on the ground who are going to show us the ropes, show us around. Um, that's, the, that's the function that we served in that place. But instead of people coming with the expectation of being shown around, 
and been introduced to the community. They came with a big stick to beat us into another shape. Now, where's your legitimacy for that? What mindset is that? You know, that's nothing to do with the dean. With the dean, you visit each other and you offer and accept hospitality. That's what we were prepared for. When the, when the, the white Muslims came from Norwich, we offered them hospitality. They didn't come, at least overtly, to um, change things and disrupt things. And if they had, then I don't know whether the two of us would have been sitting here. I mean, yeah, no, certainly uh, not. I, I, I remember coming on some of those early meetings. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and um, you know, we were people accustomed to fighting. We'd fight at the drop of a hat because we were accustomed, we had to literally fight. And um, the, um, and as I mentioned earlier, that rebelliousness and the, and the riots, and Brixton was, uh, was hot. So you have to, you have to tread carefully. You know, if you're going to come and start, you know, and if you're white, you know, then, th then think twice, if not thrice, you know, before you start trying to throw your weight around. Um, but, these, but this other influence was indifferent to any of that. They didn't, they didn't care what was there on the ground. It would come with its own agenda to change things, and it did it in ways that were insidious, um, dangerous, and, um, yeah, I'll use another strong word, un-Islamic. Anyone else have a question? Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, on the same note, um, given what you said about the ideology, why do you think that that's still appealed then to a whole section of the community? Well, that's another good question. Um, I remember trying to work it out at the time, and I could see it, and I can, I can still see it. I mean, the... We had a lot of young people um, becoming Muslim, and, um, and youth is youth. That's not going to change. Um, they'll get hold of something, and it's all theirs, and nobody can say anything to them because they, they, they know how it works. And, um, and it came in, a, in an attractive kind of package because the way it came to Brixton was via the States. And the States is and continues to be influential in the world. Just that culture, the fact that you know, you've got these kind of very sort of, um, you know, I don't know, what's the word? Um, I mean, for, for I mean, the um, black American culture was the big one for us. Mm. It was a big one. And... Um, the rest of us, you know, we were little ones. Jamaicans don't really put, place themselves second to anyone very easily. But, you know, even as a, as a small place, it punches way above its weight, but even we had to kind of, sort of, you know, kind of give the Americans their due. I mean, they've been doing some good things, and they've been influencing us anyway, I mean, since long before becoming Muslim. And so when it came from that direction, it was, it was let in, it was allowed in. Um, it came with an American accent, and with... Um, you know, with, with Saudi clothing and um, bits of Arabic thrown around, you know, with that twang. I mean, it, it, was, it was, you know, for young people that was kind of um, attractive. And um, also what made it work was that the, um, these people, they came with not just this form, this strange form, of the dean, but they also came with a way of making a living and something that had been tried and tested, you know, in places like, you know, Brooklyn and so on, and, you know, it was, and it could work in Brixton as well, you know, selling incense. And um, there was a time in Brixton when the incense economy was literally underpinned everything. I mean, it was being sold, made and sold hand over fist, and people were making decent money. And the Americans were the ones who had the experience in terms of how to work it. And um, so it's that, that combination, and, and it means that if you can give somebody work, I, talk, I spoke about giving people shelter, but if you can give people work, um, then you're influential. Yeah, so these young guys, who are not getting work anyway, this is Brixton and they're black, you know, you're not going to get a job anyway. Um, 
But when somebody can say, look, take some of this, sell that, you know, keep the money or half of it or whatever, and, um, and it works and it sells, then that's influence. And um, that explains some of the um, enthusiasm with which you know, it was taken up. Any more questions? I think the first question do I define the importance for Muslims on all sides to try and uh, not simply understand each other uh, but also the importance of trying to interact with good etiquette um, but on the second question where the particular appeal of this uh, influence might be examined uh, I've been interested in re-watching some of uh, Malcolm X's speeches uh, from the time of his uh, pilgrimage, his Hajj, mm -hmm. uh, until his death, uh, not much more than a year after. Yeah. Uh, and what's interesting is obviously you can see that there's this um, embryonic uh, understanding of pure faith. And even if his knowledge wasn't very uh, broad, it was very deep on the basic topic. Mm -hmm. And some of his appeal, <coughs> I suspect, is due to the muscular nature of his rhetoric on issues of social justice. Mm -hmm. That it went beyond, as we should all do, uh, appealing to Allah and asking of his goodness and his grace and his uh, and victory from him, but also trying to do something by the grace of Allah. Um, whereas some of the animosity that comes from the so-called Salafis, and I'm not very happy with labels on either side, um, is sometimes a reaction against seeming passivity. Uh, and I wondered where you thought the common ground is in terms of, uh, of course, focusing on spiritualism, of course, focusing on having a community, of course, focusing on uh, cleansing yourself but not uh, neglecting muscular action and retiring uh, in the sense of trying to do good and trying to yeah. effect social justice. Thank you. So much for that. I mean, it's a really excellent sort of uh, observation that are coming from, from, from the audience. I mean, this, I mean, you're touching really on the very heart of the matter, the kind of things that I was struggling with myself to come to grips with, you know, at the time. And um, these are perennial issues that, you know, that continue to face us. The, um, well, again, speaking from a personal point of view, um, it's, uh, it's, it's full of kind of contradictions because, you see, part of what I tried to describe in terms of the leadership of the Brixton community at that time um, was, in fact, it was very muscular. And one of the things that the, um, the Salafis accused us of was being too Afrocentric and too involved in issues of social justice and wanting to do things. We, yet everything is by Allah and by the grace of Allah. I mean, we, were, you know, we were people who, you know, we did the prayer and we, and we were involved in, in, in dhikr Allah. We, we, were, we were keen on transforming ourselves, you know, and raising our characters. But um, at the same time, we were building housing um, and not only building it, but re preserving it for Muslims. In other words, we were able to discriminate on behalf of Muslims and say, right, we're keeping this housing aside for Muslims. And um, now that's not an easy thing to achieve. And that takes muscle. And, and part of that muscle was, in fact, was that, uh, yeah. the Brixton riot thing. Because mm -hmm. the Brixton mosque was literally across the road from the police station, from Brixton police station, <coughs> literally opposite. That one. That yeah. one? Yeah, that's, that's, that's muscle. Mm. And um, so, and with, with the kind of reputation that black Muslims had, anyway, Muslims anyway, but the fact that we were these people who were prepared to burn the place down, even as non-Muslims, as Muslims, if you play with us, we'll burn it down again. And so, the um, people would tiptoe around us, you know, anything, you know, they wouldn't get us upset because the, the sense of jama'ah, for us was very strong. It was it, it could come across almost like a gang kind of mentality. 
we come together very easily, the drop of a hat to kind of face whatever. And um, I remember in one of the famous visits from um, Norwich, um, I think it's Hadjidris Mears, who, as white as they come, um, he came, he parked his car outside of the mosque, and um, a police officer or parking warden, I can't remember which now, decided that they were going to um, put a ticket on his car. Well, as far as we were concerned, in Brixton Mosque, white or not, he's a Muslim and you're not going to put that on his car. And so we came rushing out. They noticed in the police station across the street, they, what they're fearing is another riot. And, and it doesn't take much to kick off a riot in that kind of, in that kind of environment. And so the fact that there were black people out on the street was enough to get everybody nervous. And we knew that, and we would play on it. So the, um, the ticket soon came off the car, and that, which, which is all we wanted to achieve. Um, that, you know, to, to have some sense of um, influence and to be able to get a political result on our patch. And um, so that was our reputation then as the leadership of, that, of, of the mosque. And um, to have these other people coming in, uh, I don't think the concern was that we weren't muscular enough or active enough as, as Muslims and that we were just sitting down and um, waiting for Allah to kind of just manifest what you know we hoped would be manifest you know um, while we kind of you know sort of sat in the corner um, <clears throat> we were prepared to do things and take risks we were and some of those risks involved um, you know, we're talking about the nation state the nation state has its laws it has its limits and is not willing to give any of that up. Well, we were willing to take some of that to ourselves and to run our affairs for as far and as long as we could um, until the law tried to prevent us. In other words, taking the law into your own hands, as the saying goes. Um, if, if people needed to be punished, um, we were not averse to punishing them. You know, decisions had to be taken in terms of, I spoke earlier about some of the commercial issues. Um, well, you know, when you've got money being made and, you know, and, and things being sold and, and, you know, and people's apparent livelihood is, is um, at stake, you're gonna get, you get disputes. You, know, you get people arguing about being undercut and, um, or trying to monopolize the marketplace and so on. And, Disputes would come to, to me, and um, you have to resolve these things. Um, if you don't, then you, you know, you, you're creating a pressure cooker which is going to blow. The, um, and if you're going to make these decisions, it means you have to be able to enforce these decisions. It means it's not just giving a fatwa. It's not just saying, well, no, give that back. No, you can't do this in the marketplace. You, know, you can't have this, you can't have that. You have to, you, only if you say it, when people look in your eyes, they know you mean it. And that if you don't desist, then there'll be a, there'll be a consequence. Now, um, I'm not going to frighten anybody here by going into the details of what some of those consequences might have been. But, you know, we, um, these are the lengths that we were prepared to go to in order to um, fulfill some of what we thought it meant to be Muslim, in other words, to take on another social possibility, another political possibility, to gather some autonomy and um, power over uh, the disposition of our own wealth, our, our um, you know, our education, our um, recreation, and so on. And um, <coughs> so. You know, this was, um, you know, as I say, it's a, it's a, it's a, we took it very seriously. And as, as you said, um, like Malcolm, you know, we were serious. It's kind of naive, but you know, we we, we become Muslim. Say, Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and you establish the deen. 
you establish leadership, you establish um, jama'ah, which means you must have leadership, and the leader is the leader. And um, when a decision is made by the um, people of knowledge, then the leader reinforces it. And you have to understand um, that these are real issues. We, didn't, we tried not to just confine our attentions to the Muslims. We'd extend whatever we could to non-Muslims. Um, you know, black people have, had, were having a difficult time um, in England. And we knew from our own study of history that um, one of the mistakes or one of the traps that the black Muslims fell into was being accused of ignoring the rest of the black community and just looking after themselves as Muslims. Well, we weren't going to fall into that particular one. We went out of our way to um, share whatever we could and to set whatever example we could in terms of what might be possible um, in terms of um, organizing oneself. So um, a lot of the things we were called on to do, a lot of the things that we were called on to respond to were things which really the police should have been responding to. We'd get messages, phone calls to say, so-and-so is in trouble in such and such a place, such and such a woman has been beaten up by her husband, blah, 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 you know, what can you do, can you help us? Um, and this is a serious matter, I mean, that's, these are matters for the police. Um, but the police are slow, notoriously slow, when it comes to responding to the issues of black people. So we would get there first. And heaven help us if they'd caught us at it. Um, but um, a lot of the time we did what we did, you know, said, you know, we just said Allah and just went for it and um, got away with it a lot of the time. You're not enjoying this? Uh, I'm living it. Jazakallah okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, for like, some really interesting talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. I can't take any more questions, although I'd really like to. I think Khalil has something to say. Yeah, just, just well. briefly. Um, um, uh, thank you both. Uh, incidentally, these renditions of what you were treated to today haven't occurred before. They're, they're very much off the script um, of, of what I've experienced. So, alhamdulillah, I, I, I well, It's down to the very interesting questions that came. Yeah, well, that as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, my, my part was really arriving several of stages after what's been mentioned today. Um, and um, you know, certainly during my time in Norwich, um, many things have been built. Um, some of which we, we're hoping to introduce with this event taking place uh, in a month's time. Um, many different platforms are now that serve many different functions within the community and out with the community, online, worldwide, um, not least of which is um, the Muslim Faculty of Advanced Studies, which you might have realised that all these gentlemen are uh, members of. <coughs> so that uh, Muslim Faculty will have one of the zones of presentation that will take place and that will come in the form of uh, understanding, you know, really trying to understand what community is about, the essence of it, the community imperative, and that will take the form of a symposium. As well as that, we have a very strong Muslim women's group um, who are uh, in this particular opportunity inviting Judy Siddiqui. Uh, from the Islamic Society of Britain. She's joining the Norwich Muslim Women's Community uh, in having a, a workshop, which has been titled Promoting and Empowering Muslim Women Through Business. But in reality, it's Promoting and Empowering Muslim Women Through Community. And that really has to be sort of grasped to be understood. It's not as simple as just businesses. The Dino and the Dirham coins um, you might have heard of 
the gold dinar and the silver dirham. Um, basically, there is going to be a, an official launch of uh, a new silver dirham coin. Poetry evening. The Women's Health Forum taking place on the Sunday. And um, probably one of the most sort of subtle but most interesting events will take place um, in the Saturday evening, which will be a night of the of dhikr, the Shadli Dalqawi Taraka. Now that, incidentally, was what the men who visited England from Morocco were immersed in, and to a large degree was a means for Allah to have moved their hearts to become Muslim. So there was a, a version of that type of thing uh, in the form of uh, singing of Qasidas from the Diwan of Sheikh Mohammed Ibn al Habib, who you saw a picture of, who was the, the person uh, who Sheikh Abdul Qadir met in, in the 60s. So that will take place on uh, Saturday evening. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to go on anymore. Um, you, inshallah, you have some flyers. Um, there'll be more information available on our uh, Facebook page and on the Muslims of Norwich um, uh, website. And I invite everyone, Bismillah. Thank you very much for having us, and thank a big thank you to the organisers. <laughs> and we have some, uh, there's also some important announcements, uh, like just this chapter. Yes, Salaam for everyone. Um, Zakallah khair to the speakers who have given us, inshallah, a very insightful talk today. Um, we're, uh, as you, some of you may or may not know, on Saturday the 1st of March we're having our roundup dinner for the EIW. And we're selling tickets outside, so if you're a member of the Islamic Society, the tickets are seven pounds. If you're not a member, then the tickets are free. So if you're interested I'm not in, <laughs> <laughs> obviously yes. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in having a lovely evening of like with a quiz and lovely food, then come see us outside after this, inshallah. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>